Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Jeremy Parvin and Lily here. As you know, I've created a passive income stream of over $50,000 a month in rental income. My current portfolio is worth over $6.5 million. I've done all this while working a full-time job and on my channel, I'm going to teach you how you can do it too. Oh, don't forget to smash the like button to help our channel. I've got an exciting first guest on my show, attorney at law, broker owner, Tim Shaw. Tim has been a real estate broker since 1984, a general contractor since 1986, an attorney at law since 2008. He's specializes in negotiation, real estate transactions, rental property, property management, new construction, maintenance, and real estate investing. Tim has an undergrad from Lee University and he got his JD from South Texas College of Law. Tim was a realtor at age 20 and then after four years he started his own realty company. At age 25 he became a licensed contractor. Over the next few years he developed three low-income housing tax credit programs and then he went back to law school and that's where I met Tim. I was in my freshman and junior year of college and met Tim and I just really enjoyed talking to him about being in the game. I was interested in real estate my whole life because my dad had been doing that and we just developed a friendship. Me, him, and Bergen Mueller, if you're out there watching this, send me a comment, Bergen. We would love to hear from you, man. So welcome, Tim. Well, thank you. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity here. And I don't know why you chose me, but hey, I've admired your show for quite a while. And I'm coming to you live from my mother's hospital room. I didn't want to miss your show or miss thank being you. a part of it. So I'm just happy that you asked me to do it. Thank you, Tim. And I understand you spent the night there last night as well. So That's right. I've, I slept right here in this contraption that I'm in now. <laughs> Thank you for, for doing this. Uh, one of the things when I was talking to Tim earlier this week, I was asking about stats and numbers. A lot of people keep track of how many transactions and deals and houses they have and all that kind of stuff. And he was like, oh, no, I never really have. But uh, when I did start, I did 20 to 25 houses a year building them. And then he sold about twice as many as he built when he started. Do you want to speak to any kind of volumes? My, my first year was actually uh, 1981. I was an affiliate broker. Uh, then I, I left to open up my own company in 85. In 81, the interest rates were 17.5%. People talk about the market. The market's great right now. Of course, it's a seller's market. So the buyers are finding it a little bit difficulty. Maybe it's you know really a little bit more difficult to find the, the good deal you want to buy. The interest rates are fabulous, fantastic. It's easy to get a loan. It wasn't always that way. The first year was really tough, but I learned how to do some interesting things like we did we did owner financing mm -hmm. and we did some lease with options. Those kind of things come in handy when the market is, say, uh, different than it is today. If it's a buyer's market where the sellers are not really getting the prices that they want, maybe the, the sellers can get a little bit more creative to bump up that price a little bit. Mm -hmm. So uh, it came in handy later. P things picked up for me in around 82, 83. I found out that there's people out there who really need us. They can't seem to find the home that they're looking for. Or if they do find one, it's not in the shape that they want it to be in. It doesn't have the amenities that they want it to be in. So with the construction and remodeling, we can just make that happen. We do a lot of creative things like that. If people come in and want a fireplace or they want to have another bathroom or, you know, we can do all of that. And so I went out, I knocked on doors in housing projects, knocked on doors in mobile home parks, and I asked them simply this, would you like to have a better place to live for the same kind of money that you're paying now? And they all said yes. So mm -hmm. that volume really picked up. I was rocking and rolling by the second and third and fourth year. I went into my broker's office and I said, either sell me half the company or I'm leaving to open up my own. And it just done fabulous ever since. There's been some, you know, like all roller coaster rides, we rode out the hard times. Everybody remembers 2008, 2009. Before that, we had the stock market crash, I think, of 1999 or 2000. Really, what's made this work for me is my real estate investments. I've seen people come and go in the real estate, but those that last are the ones that make the investments. You mentioned when you started, you were right in the middle of that super high inflation and interest rates. We're predicted for some of that to happen again with all these stimulus packages. And so, if that happens again, right. you'll you'll see these same kind of creative financing deals that you could just plug and play. Well, I think right now everybody who owns real estate is excited on the one hand because your property values are going to be inflated and they're going to go up. Building materials are out of sight. If you do sell something, of course, you want to try to shelter your profits. But uh, whether you do or whether you don't, you want to replace that investment. And so you have to understand when you sell something, you're going to wind up having to pay more also for your next purchase. Right. And you may have right. a home that you only paid 150000 for it, and today you might be offered 250 for it, and you think, hey, what a good deal. You sell it, you go out and look for that same type of property, and you find out the price is around 250 So it's kind of a, a shock to people. But the market's changing, prices are going up. This has happened before. In the 70s, these same houses were selling in the teens. I know you have a hard time imagining that, but today they're 175000 200000 those same houses. Is it going to be wow. tomorrow that it's one or two million?
Think about a person just, you know, that has a house they live in, in, in that scenario that you mentioned. You know, they, they paid $150 and they could sell it for $250 today, but then they've got to go buy another place to live. What do you say to those people right now? Well, I want them to find the place that they want to buy before they put their house on the market. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you're selling and you sell your house first, a month or two later you go to buy your house and the prices have gone up even higher. So you want to be sure to find the house first, get it on a contract, get your loan started, and then put your house on the market. And that's kind of reverse of what you would have told people over the last uh, 10 years, right? Because it's absolutely reverse. I would tell people, sell your house first, get your money, then go out and find a house. Find your house first, get it under contract, and then sell yours because you can probably sell it in 24 hours kind of thing? Yeah. It's still okay. quick. You know, my banker asked me a couple of weeks ago if I thought about retirement. I said, what for? I said, I don't work. This is fun. <laughs> Why would I ever want to quit? That's I living the dream. every minute of it. And I love real estate too. For me, it's not really a job. I, I enjoy the heck out of that. Oh, uh, yeah. I wouldn't think about doing anything else. What are some tips that you would tell people who want to get started in real estate investing? When a young person comes to my office or someone who's older, anyone who has never owned any real estate before, I want to encourage them to take advantage of Fannie Mae's one to four family loan program, which has a low down payment, a fixed interest rate, and a long-term loan. You want to buy a four family home, quadruplex, as it's commonly known. And the reason is because it will generate an income for them and help supplement their existing income. It's the best way to get started in real estate investing. You'll have gonna, fixed this is rate, what you low tell. interest, long term, all this in is one what package. You tell. And you I'm can sorry. only have 10 Fannie Mae's. When you get a Fannie Mae loan, you're limited to 10 loans. And you want to make sure those 10 are all quadruplexes. Let your first one be a quadruplex, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth. Guess what? Your 11th home can just about be anything that you want. Walk <laughs> into the bank with 40 rental properties, fixed rate, long-term, low interest rate loans, and they're going to love your income, whatever scenario you've got. Whether you've got a career, an income from that, or whether you're just living off that rental income, they will want to make you a jumbo loan for you to get that mansion that you've always wanted. And you'll be able to afford it with 40 rentals to support you. I love that scenario. You mentioned this to me earlier, and I just never thought about it like that. I'm a single family home guy. And my dad had multi-unit uh, houses or dwellings, I should say. And this is a great strategy. Sometimes people come to me and say, I'm a real estate investor. I say, how many properties do you own? I got 15 properties. How many loans do you have? I got 15 loans. They can't even qualify for one Fannie Mae, whatever property they're going to buy. They're going to have a minimum 20% down payment. Now, see on those quadruplexes, you can live in one unit and pay almost nothing down. FHA, 3%. Conventional is 5%. So the financing is there for you to take advantage of the one to four family. I started out buying single family homes, and that's still what I do, one or two a year while working a full-time job. And I got... 10 Freddie Fannies, like you said, max those out and then had to start going to commercial loans. And I think something just to kind of say, not only can you get the great interest rates that you would get on a single family home or a one, two, three, or four quadplex that we're talking about, you can qualify for the same kind of loans that all uh, homeowners get. And so it's the super low interest rate, it's the super low down payment, and it's also the very long term of 30 years. Something that Tim didn't mention there is also that if it's just a regular investment loan, it would only be 20 years and the interest rate would be probably about a good point higher or more, would you say, Tim? Oh yeah, and often it's a lot more than one point higher, like 2.2% 2, 2 .2 more for an investment property. That's yep. with 20% down. So the beauty of it, yeah, so this is like very little down, you can kind of live for free. It's a brilliant plan and just basically repeat. How quickly do you think people could do this and then move into their second one? Do you think they can do it in less than a year or do they need to stay in that first one a year before they repeat this process? The loan requirements are that you have the intent to live there. All right, so when you move in, you have the intent to live in that, that unit and you haven't located another quadruplex to buy, nor have you made the intent to buy another because you haven't found it yet. So once you get settled in, there's no real reason why you can't start looking around. It may take you a month. It may take you a year to find another quadruplex that is on the market, that's available to you, that's not pre-sold, that you can buy. So however long it takes. And what kind of beds and baths would you look for in these quads? Are they typically like a two one or two bedroom one bath or can you get into a three bedroom two bath in some of these quadruplexes? I think the modern trend that everyone seems to want is a, a minimum of two bathrooms. And often you'll see them two and a half, three, three and a half. A lot of the older people are wanting single level. So a lot of those are being built that are very upscale, single level, depending on what your rental market is where you're at, you may want to rent. These units often are 15, 16, 1800, maybe 2000 
a month. If you tried to put in a quadruplex with one bathroom, I'd be surprised if you could get eight or nine hundred a month. Well, two two is is still good. Uh, three two is in demand. Well, I know in the in the single family home market that I play in, people really like a three two, and I actually like you know I have some that are four bedrooms and two and a half baths. But what I've found is a, a bigger house that has a lot of square footage doesn't get me much more rent relative no, it to. No, doesn't. It'll just cost me more to buy and cost me more to maintain. It's just the number of rooms. Yep. Because I and think so, people go in, and a lot of times they don't want you to to use the word you know, master bedroom anymore. I know there's some rules out there that say you you shouldn't. The suite, as we call it. Yeah. It's the size of the suite that matters to most buyers. And the other bedrooms for the kids or guests, they're not so concerned about that as much as they are the suite. What I've found for my model works best is a small three or four bedroom house is what I like on the Mm -hmm. single family. And so when I was thinking about this and I think about quadplexes, in my mind I was wondering, you know, are those just two bedrooms? But I'm really happy to hear, I like your model even more now that I hear, no, we're talking about having three twos and even, you know, four threes perhaps. So love your model. I think that's a fantastic uh, kind of cookie cutter blueprint for people to think about getting started. We didn't talk about this the other day, but one step up, I'm going to tell you that when you buy that quadruplex, make sure that it's built as townhomes. So you'll be actually buying lot one, lot two, lot three, lot four of whatever development it is so that you could actually sell them later individually or as a quadruplex. That gives you more liquidity, by the way. Hey, something you mentioned yesterday we should probably bring up. You know, that uh, this whole real estate investing thing, at least what I like to teach on the channel, it's not speculating. It's not a get rich quick. You want to touch on that a second? You know, a lot of people want to get into real estate. They think they're going to make a million dollars within a year. And that's just not really realistic. And what's realistic is for you to set a goal for a certain number of units or what people often call doors. A door meaning one one living unit. People can set a goal for a an amount. But what do we do with inflation with that? I mean, if you said, I want to own a million dollars worth of property. Well, today that's only about four big houses. If you were looking at 20 years ago, maybe that would have been uh, as much as 10 houses. So in the future, it could be only one house. So I tend to think, you know, the numbers are not going to work out. And who knows what's going to happen with our economy? Are we going to be using the dollar uh, 10 years from now, or we're going to have a Bitcoin? I don't know. But what I do know is that everyone's going to have to have a place to live. So you mentioned, you know, people think 10 years from now, think 20 years from now, and it's a fantastic way to add a a major amount of wealth and income stream into your retirement. And that's how I've always looked at it while working in corporate. Now I'm really seeing the benefits of this, you know, really starting to pay off and be significant. I think part of why I wanted just to do this channel to show folks that you can, everybody can do this slowly over their career, doing something else, doing it on the side or taking it full-time like uh, Tim has. This guy I met in Destin, Florida, he's only invested in resorts and shopping malls, and he's done a lot better than I have (laughs) because he doesn't focus on the single-family homes or the quadruplexes. He goes for the the big real estate investments, and he's been in the real estate business the exact same number of years that I have, but his portfolio looks a lot different than mine, (laughs) and the numbers are on his side are a lot bigger. You know, I really admired him, and he gave me food for thought when I met it. The amount of effort that we put into making a deal happen is the same. You know, we have to learn about the real estate market. We learn about who finances it, who insures these houses, who works on them and maintains them, who occupies them. And it's no different in the commercial market. You know, when you're looking at a commercial property, you know, some people are moved in that direction. Is it riskier? Well, you know, like any real estate investor, we try to limit our investment by learning everything we can about it. And so if someone is just going out and buying something without trying to figure out what it's worth, yes, that's risk. You could pay Mm. too much. You might buy something that needs a lot of work if you haven't looked at the plumbing or looked at the electrical or looked at the condition of the, the frame. If you've not done your homework, yes, it's very risky. But if you've done all your homework, we've eliminated the risk and we're going to walk away from those things that are overpriced or need too much work or won't pay if we buy it at their price. You know, we're only looking for the properties that we can make a profit on today. We're not looking for speculation. Maybe this will improve or maybe we can fix it up enough to make a profit in the future. We're looking for that deal that we can make money on today. I often tell my sellers, if they come to me, want me to buy, you have to sell it to me at a price that I can sell it tomorrow for a profit. I'm not looking to speculate. I was thinking about some of this knowing a good deal when you see it, buying good deals. And that's harder today probably than, you know, in in recent history. You told a story, maybe you'll touch on that in a minute, where you kind of found a deal even in today's market. This year, you did one of these where you bought a house below 
market price. You did it by paying cash. I've bought two for cash this year and four for cash last year. I even paid over on one of them this year. But I did buy one last year below market. Let me go back though. People will say, you know, well, what is a good deal? And I think you said something that clicked with me. It's you can't define it, but you'll know it when you see it. And what I've told people to do is focus on between five and 10 subdivisions and get to know those subdivisions and watch those, put them on your Zillow search and get a feel for what a good deal is in that neighborhood, you know, on a cost per Absolutely. square foot. And so when you see one pop up, you're ready. You would know what a good deal is or isn't the second that it hits Zillow. And you're absolutely of, right. And what you've described is what we call, in the industry, we call farming. Get to know an area, become the expert in that area. You're going to know what is a good deal and what is not. We have the pyramid. At the top of the pyramid is the, the highest and best price that any property will sell for. And at that level, there are not very many buyers. All your investors have dropped out. They don't want to pay top dollar. Your investors are down at the very bottom where there's the greatest number of buyers. So when you do find that bargain, mm. if you don't buy it quick, it's going to go to one of the investors. So often I went up buying my properties either at an auction or I find property that it appears that no one wants. And so the deal you're talking about was this year I actually sold one of my investment properties. I was under contract to do it. This contract is what was called a lease option. So I didn't really want to take the money and I put it in a 1031 exchange, mm -hmm. which meant I had to go find some other property. So I went out to look for the bargain properties mm -hmm. and I found a couple of properties that had been on the market for a long time mm -hmm. and that they've been pending several times. In the industry, you know, we, we learned that these properties are on the market. They've been pending. Pendings have dropped. There's a reason why the, maybe the lenders didn't approve them or maybe the buyers and sellers just had too many disagreements but for somebody like me that's time for me to come focus on that property the one that you got interested in, i'm sure was that 16 1700 square foot brick i told you about it on a corner lot yep. had a couple of fireplaces in it very nice house they'd had it listed for like 164 it it hadn't sold been on the market for a while but did i pay 164 for it no i sent them an offer for 142,000, and then i went ahead and picked up the phone i called the agent explained to them I'm buying property and I'm buying it now and I'm not going to be buying it a month from now. I'm not going to be negotiating. This is my highest and best <laughs> offer. So go tell your seller that they don't have to worry about this deal falling through. They don't have to worry about getting it appraised. They don't have to worry about somebody knocking the deal out. The banker's saying no. Mm -hmm. If they want to sign these papers two or three weeks from now, as soon as you can get me a deed, you can have your money. And of course, the agent was thinking, no, they'll never do this. But as I predicted, the seller took it. And that was wow. the thing that cinched the deal was that it was over and done with. They were going to get their money. They didn't have to worry about it falling through or anything like that. And today that house is rented for 1595 a month, which is a good rental income on it. I actually had another deal where the realtor owned the property. He had the property listed and it had been on the market for a long time. You know, I called him on the phone and I I asked him if he didn't mind if I went and looked at it. I went to look at it. And then I called him back and I said, I don't want to offend you. Tell me if I should just, you know, look at some other property, but I'm willing to make you a cash offer. And it's a take it or leave it situation. We were able to come to a deal. I want to say it was 30% less than he was asking for it. We were able to cinch this deal between what I offered him and three thousand dollars you know he went up a little bit from my original offer i brought him back down and we settled somewhere it's just three thousand dollars more than what i offered him and i told him okay i would do it just to make the deal happen no if you're not in real estate get in the game life is just like monopoly play it in real life who wins at monopoly the ones that buy the real estate very well said and i love that game i love that game too thanks for your time thanks for being on the channel we'd love to have you back sometime in the future in the comments let us know what questions you have for me or for tim let us know what topics you might want us to cover if we talk Tim into coming back. I'm sure if you guys click the like button and comment, it might inspire Tim to come back. Tim, I just want to well, say thanks when again. I come back instead of having my mom suffering as she is, but she's fully recovered. She's a real estate investor, but she owns her own portfolio of real property. She's been retired for quite some time, has been living off of rental. Income. Tim, thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Okay, thanks. Put us some comments down below with any questions for me or for Tim. Until next time, hope you have a great week.